to get to know us, um, and actually to get to know you all as well. We're going to play Mad Libs, which some of you might know growing up. Um, so let me start. We're going to do role system person. So as an example, um, I am Carol Tan, and my role is opinion orchestrator. Uh, I advocate for economic and social policy and financial policy and par uh, partnerships at a legacy foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation. And we are, well, and personally, I'm a woman in philanthropy from Asia. I very recently came back to philanthropy after um, a couple of years uh, in service in government. So that's a little bit of where I'm coming from. And I would love to turn to Veronica on my left. Um, and she, uh, and you can see, I will not talk too much about like our specific roles, et cetera. You're gonna hear from each of us. So Veronica is at the BHP Foundation, uh, but I'd love for you to tell us role system person. Role system person. Uh, so I eat, sleep, and breathe all things impact <laughs> at a new actor, I would say a new philanthropy, a corporate philanthropy tied to a very controversial donor, um, probably the largest mining company in the world. <laughs> and uh, personally, I describe myself as having won the birth lottery, having been born in the US during a time when it was okay and you became legally able to be there. But my family is from some of the not so pretty parts of Latin America. And so I have always felt passionate and motivated about leveraging that uh, luck, that opportunity that I've had to try to make the world a better place. How is that? That's perfect. Okay. <laughs> Row systems present. Uh, good morning, everybody. Let me try that again. Good morning, everyone. All right. <laughs> I just want to make sure we're not here alone. Um, so Rose, uh, I am a chief beggar. Um, I beg for money. I also give money, but at this moment, I still beg for a lot of money for the last 20 years. Uh, I'm also a chief guide in my office. Um, I've got a team of a relatively young staff, so half the time is trying to tell them, you know, you write your emails this way and you don't write your emails like text messages. Um, so that's my role. Um, I work in an organization for the Majority Trust. I'm from Singapore. Uh, I just got over my jet lag this morning and I'm leaving tomorrow back to Singapore, so that's like, I'm trying to get around it. Uh, We're a philanthropic organization, so in systems-wise, I work with two groups of people. I work with donors and I aggregate their funds and I work with grantee partners and I do grant making. Um, so that's the interchange and that's the intersection that I play with. Uh, on the person side, I'm a father of two girls, 16 and 14 and a husband of one wife. Try not to mistake that. Um, and um, I am a social entrepreneur. Over the last 20 years, I've always been in nonprofit. I've built a uh, foundation called the Halogen Foundation that works with young people. And then I went to academia to uh, work in a university to lead an institute for societal leadership. Uh, and now, for the last five years, I run the Majority Trust. Thank you. So um, we're going to ask you all to do the same. Um, you know, turn to the person next to you. Let's do role system person. And um, let's go. So I hope you met someone really interesting. Um, and can I please? Hey, guys. Good morning. <laughs> it's great that you're having wonderful conversations. You should absolutely continue. And there will be opportunity as we go through the next hour or so. Um, if you were sitting on this side and you want to move in closer, I encourage you to because we will be doing a lot of discussion. So please move in, feel free to. But I am going to jump in um, because from, I think one of the things that we're talking about here is, you know, clearly philanthropy based on the title of the panel. And from a poll, you can see uh, some of the words that are on the screen. Um, if we could flip to the screen. Okay, I'll tell you what some of those words are that we tend to hear about philanthropy. You see some of them, um, you know, influential, powerful, America, uh, rich. Of course, it's not quite grammatical because we crowdsource this. Um, outdated, uh, top down, um, but also, you know, humanitarian, supportive, crucial. I think we see the two sides of 
philanthropy here, sort of two truths that we need to hold in tension and understand that both of them right now in our imperfect world, um, just they, they exist the way that it is. And so the first is that philanthropy is really necessary and there has been a lot of good that has come from it. At the same time, um, recognizing that philanthropy has not been at all perfect and perhaps should like, it may not structurally be ideal that it exists um, at all, right? Um, and yet, and despite all its flaws, it's here, we are still in this world like today and that's why we wanna talk a little bit about the practices for what do we do right now, some of the things that we're seeing from our experience and how to move forward. And that's why we want to have this conversation with you, um, just to hear what you, where your head's at, how do we keep moving and Certainly, there has been progress over the last 100 years because those of you who are uh, familiar with philanthropy um, probably know of uh, Carnegie's Gospel of Wealth, which no need to read the whole thing. The key part is where it's underlined, which basically um, talked a little bit about how, you know, like the philanthropist, the person of wealth, in his judgment, um, should do the best thing for his community because he has superior wisdom, because they and he can do better for, um, better than they can do for themselves, which is all the things that <laughs> clearly a lot of people um, are critiquing nowadays. And yet, 100 years later, we are in a place where we are talking about the problems with winners take all. The fact that we can have a chorus of people talking about decolonizing wealth, and that's, um, that's, that's the hope that I, I hope that we can bring to this conversation today, right? Um, it's the idea that there has been progress, we can make progress, and the reason this, is, this session is called Humankind is because we have good, like human nature has good in it, and we can be better, so let's do that. And so, um, I will say one thing, um, in case you know people need to hop in and out and stuff, if you take nothing else away from any of our conversation, I think this will flow through from what we're talking about today, um, how we give matters, how we donate, how we invest, whatever type of capital you do or you have uh, or how you move with it, how we do it matters, not just what we give to or how much we give. So just if nothing else, that is all I uh, ask you to sort of take away from this conversation. So um, I would remind us that we're talking about practice today. So let's talk about the positive examples, the ways that we can actually do this better um, in order to move forward. And therefore, I want to turn to my old friend Martin and my new, uh, that's totally wrong, <laughs> my old friend Veronica and my new friend Martin and ask them from their experience to share a little bit um, their vision for what Better Angels Driven Philanthropy looks like. And if, if there's any questions about like what Better Angels and Worse Angels are, you know, the, the um, image we have of one angel on this side and the other angel on this side. So pick the right angel, that's all I'm saying. Um, and so, yes, please share with us what, what a new vision for better angels driven philanthropy could look like and what is the appropriate role of funder in that, in that world. And um, uh, Martin, if I could ask you to start and sort of share from your experience. <laughs> we were doing Caesar's paper stone as to see who's going on next. Um, I actually love the idea of this concept of better angels and philanthropy because it does uh, contrast that there are actually you know, worse angels in philanthropy. Uh, we have seen how philanthropy does a lot of good for society, but at the same time, we also see the collateral damage. Uh, sometimes if we don't think through the entire supply chain or where the money goes, how the money helps, and how the grants help to a certain extent. Um, so when I think about better angels or, or our role and an appropriate role as a funder, um, I tend to think about what are some of the superpowers that we as funders have. Uh, as I was sharing with you, I, I come from two sides of the coin. Over the last two decades, I've always been a non-profit. Um, a large part of my life, I've been begging for money. Um, but now, I'm also, over the last five years, have been able to get the money and become a grant maker. Uh, and Ver Veronica will say that, you know, as a grant maker, you are the smartest person in the room. You are the cutest person in the room and you're the tallest person in the room. Um, and then I realized that, hey, as funders, we do have certain superpowers. Uh, one of the superpowers is this idea of convening. You know, when we call for meetings, people come. I've never had that before, <laughs> which is really rather nice. Um, and it's not just 
um, the grantee partners or the charities on the ground, but it's also stakeholders. Uh, just last week, we have a whole week uh, focused on research and social impact measurement in Singapore. Uh, we had Amri Aronson from Robin Hood Foundation in Singapore uh, to con conduct a series of events. Um, and we brought together all the research teams of the Singapore government together. Um, all the different ministries, the different entities, and they tell me it's the first time that all the researchers who are interested in social impact are coming together. And then I realized, wow, as a funder, we do have a superpower uh, in convening. Uh, the second thing is this whole idea that we could actually nudge donors and philanthropists to think differently. Um, I think in Asia, we have a lot to catch up on compared to what you guys are here. But this whole idea of trust-based philanthropy is an important aspect of a baton age old conversation. Uh, because we are not as big into unrestricted funds. Uh, there is this power dynamic that grant makers tend to have over grantee partners that we tell you what to do and so on and so forth. We're trying to shift that at the majority trust to say that, hey, we trust the experts on the ground. How do we give them the resources they, they need and let them do what they need to do? Because we are not the experts. We, I mean, let's change that. Our donors are the experts at making money. So that's what their expertise are. But how do we take that and give it unrestricted? So those are the kind of conversations and uh, to really get our donors and philanthropists to think differently um, and say there is a need for us to actually trust uh, the group a lot more. And then last but not least, and I'll pass the time, is this whole idea of collaborative impact. Um, in Asia, in Singapore in particular, I, I operate largely within Singapore. The social issues are getting far, far more complex these days. It used to be easier. You know, when you want to deal with poverty, you roughly know the key things that you need to ad address. But now it's getting far more complex. We have multi-generation poverty, we have multi-generational issues. When you solve one, it creates another problem. Um, what that means is that there's no longer a one-size-fits-all solution, and there's no longer a single-actor solution. Government alone cannot solve the problem. Private sector alone cannot solve the problem. Philanthropists alone cannot solve the problem. How do we, using the convening power, uh, to actually create collaborative impact? How can we work with each other? How can we throw our ego aside and say, you know what? Let's see what we can put on the table instead of what we can take from the table. What we can put together in the conversation and say, you know what? If this is going to solve this, this is going to be my part I play. So collaborative impact, the whole idea of uh, really nurturing trust-based philanthropy uh, within our shores, um, and this whole idea of being able to convene uh, some of the things that we can do. Yeah, thank you. Um, and one of the things that we have discussed as well, Morgan, is, um, I, and I would love for you to share a little bit with, with all our friends here, is um, the idea of fund utilization. Um, and, and, you know, can you just tell us a little bit about sure. that concept and what, what does that mean? How do you do it? So th this whole idea has been on my mind for a while. Um, how do we make philanthropic capital efficient? I, I think that's the question I keep asking myself. Um, I'm not against endowments, so many folks here have your endowments, and endowments allows perpetuality, right? It allows a long-term thinking. Uh, but what happens is that when funds are raised and being sat in the bank, and you only take a portion out each time, uh, you're actually removing philanthropic capital uh, from the market. When, so there's a phrase we say, you know what, we need to keep for rainy days. Um, I learned a saying recently that, you know, it doesn't matter if it's keeping for a rainy day when it's pouring outside. Uh, and some of the situation we're facing now, they're pouring outside. We need more resources today. Um, so two numbers that we uh, look at at Majority Trust is something called commitment rate and utilization rate. For every fund raise, uh, that we, for every fund we raise, within 12 months, we want to achieve 100% commitment rate. That's our commitment to our donors. Within 12 months, the fund will be allocated out. Within 24 months, we will try to achieve 95% utilization rate. And we will hold our grantee partners accountable. It means that when you submit a grant to us, we approve the grant. Within 24 months, you must put it into action. You must utilize the money. Uh, now, it will never get 100% because things change, currency fluctuation, the pound drop, what, whatever that might be. You will never achieve 100% utilization because there's changes to programs, but we try to achieve 95%. But the key thing is how do we achieve 100% commitment? It means that the team that actually scopes out the fund will only raise what we need for that year. So sometimes in an emergency like COVID, for example, there are people who actually raise millions and millions of dollars. I have a university in Singapore, I won't mention name. Well, you guys won't know it anyway, but I won't mention name. Um, they raised during COVID $7 million and they put in their annual report. And in 2020, after raising, they only utilized 600000 So what they have done 
in the name of prudence, they have actually removed $6 million of, political, uh, of philanthropic capital from the market. It's an inefficient use of the market. So what we're trying to do is to scope out a way of looking at philanthropic capital from an efficiency lens and say we will only raise what we need, and we impose that on ourselves, and we tell our donors, this particular fund we've achieved 100%, this fund we've achieved 95%. Sometimes, because the donors sit on our grant panel, I have one fund that the, the grant panel said, you know what, we'll commit 120%. I say, hey, you know, you say it's easy for you to say, I've got to raise the money. But because the donors are my grand panel, the donors say, you know what, if you cannot raise the additional 20%, I will underwrite it. That's because the grant proposals are so good that they don't want anyone to go to waste. So they are prepared to backstop it. Um, so those are the ways that we're trying to think. How can we create a system where donors have a part to play in it um, and the grantee partners have a part to shape it, but in a way that makes philanthropic capital efficient? Wonderful, thank you. And Veronica, you've seen many phases of philanthropy. Um, you know, you've been, you've had a career over the last. I don't even want to tell everyone how long because it's, you know, she looks. Yeah. Um, and I, I would love to hear what you think. What does the vision of better angels-driven philanthropy look like? What are some of the practices that you've seen or you've experienced that could really get us in that direction? Sure. Thanks. Uh, and so, uh, I'll just share that um, I've spent probably maybe the last 15 years in philanthropy. And if you were to have asked me many years ago you know, what I was going to do when I was going to grow up, it was not going to be working in the philanthropic sector. Um, and so I've worked for one of the oldest philanthropies, along with Carol, um, one of the largest philanthropies in terms of the MasterCard Foundation. And now I'm working with one of the newest philanthropies. Uh, and I would say, from a superpower perspective, just to build on Martin's point, well, um, I think convening is definitely something that's important. Uh, uh, philanthropy is often seen as a neutral actor, although in sharing that in my graduate school class at Columbia, my students were like, but they're really not neutral. Uh, and it's true, they're not neutral, but there's this perception that neutrality allows you to bring diverse and different perspectives together to solve problems. I would say another superpower is the ability to amplify. Does anyone know, um, just generally speaking, and not including the capital markets, but uh, generally speaking, when you look at all the dollars that are going to doing good, you know, we typically talk about government dollars. Does anyone have a sense of how big or small philanthropy is within that global market? What is the percent? Like, is it like 50%, 75%, 25%? Of, of the government, 2%. All right, so when you look at the, all of the dollars that are going into doing good and not looking at the capital markets, private sector, just looking at the government dollars, when you take into account philanthropic capital, it, it's not too far from 2%. It's actually 7%. All the philanthropy, philanthropic capital, the Rockefeller, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust in the European market, only makes up 7% of that which means that we're continuously talking about optimization. How do we use that 7% as risk capital, as convening, at, to amplify learnings that perhaps neither government sector nor private sector can take? Uh, and so for me, it, it's limited resources. While it feels like we are working within a sea of free resourcing, we're not, we're limited, and we're a small fish in a very big pond. And so we have to continuously be challenging ourselves to optimize. Uh, and we do that through things like proving and demonstrating the potential effectiveness or efficiency of an idea, and hoping that we are able to use our brand to amplify our learning. Uh, and so lots of examples around that in the mining industry, for example, um, the BHP is, a, is uh, fairly large. They, um, they, are, they, in 2017, announced a social value strategy. And uh, part of that strategy is about being more transparent about the communities in which mining companies work within, which is primarily indigenous communities. And part of the challenge of being, uh, wanting to do the right thing within a competitive market is that if you go out and are first out the gate and are transparent, even if you're being the most responsible actor in the system, it's going to work against you. 
And the reason it'll work against you is because number one, no one else is being transparent. So the criticism will just come to you. You are basically the baseline. And number two, there's a lot of impact washing happening. Uh, and so the BHP launched something called the BHP Foundation, an independent philanthropy based in the US, of which I am now chief impact and evaluation officer at, in order to try to change the system with some of their profit. And so as an independent philanthropy, we work on global transparency and open contracting. And we make the case to actually uh, the regulators to uh, require mining companies and other companies to be more transparent with their data. Because if everybody, if we even out the playing field, then actors will have the opportunity to do the right thing and compete at an equal basis. And so we're taking something, we're proving something, and we're amplifying it for the betterment of the world. And so that's how we see the superpower of philanthropy playing out. I would say, though, so here's uh, the point around um, what Martin said. You know, when I first joined, back in the day when I first joined uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, um, I remember very smart women uh, who hired me said, "You have well, welcome to the Rockefeller Foundation. You have just become funnier and taller and smarter. And I was really confused. I just didn't know what working in philanthropy was really about. And in fact, you know, I just I spent then the next 15 years in and out of all of these various roles with people really thinking that everything I said was fantastic. And I realized that I have to, well, you know, I and we in the philanthropic community really begin to believe that. Our philanthropic space is based on a lot of ego and a lot of people that do not have lived experience making decisions about people community. And so there's an inherent contradiction in our work. Uh, and so I think a better philanthropy would be to number one, acknowledge that uh, contradiction, acknowledge that the default context is that a bunch of very arrogant, we saw it in the world, word cloud, arrogant, very privileged, very white, uh, very elite communities making choices about bettering the day-to-day -day of people that they've never ever connected with and engaged with. And I think better philanthropic practice would number one, acknowledge that, and number two, begin to respond to the how. The how in terms of how are you operationalizing? How are you hiring? How are, how are you valuing evidence? Um, in, an, in my other role, I'm also the president of the American Evaluation Association, and I think about evidence an awful lot. Uh, and evidence looks many different ways. You know, in philanthropy, we have the flexibility to redefine what evidence is for decision making. And so we have the opportunity to test things like and engage with things like feedback and listening, for example, via 60 decibels or just trying to bypass all of the middle people and get to actual community and co-create and value that information as part of our decision-making cycle. And so I'm happy to talk more about that, but that's really, you know, big picture. If we were to do one thing different, yeah. I would say that that would be that thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I'm sure there's a lot of food for thought, and I just want to quickly add uh, two points, and then what we want to hear, you know, you all to have the ability to chat through some of these uh, as well and reflect on them. Um, well, I think first, uh, and just to also amplify the point that we, the collaboration is really important, the convening is really important, and and but when we start, I mean, at the end of the day, like we hear those of you here who are like us and sitting sort of more in the. Um, the, the funding side of things, our role is first and foremost to fund. And I, I think let's not forget that. Um, we, I, I, you know, I want to, we should talk about how we fund and all that, but let's fund, let's give more if we can, um, out of, and as generously as possible out of a mindset of abundance versus out of a mindset of scarcity, because we have a lot more than the vast majority of people, and it might not be our own, but we are, stewards in some ways of it, and let's do the best that we can with it. I think that's just an important point to underscore. Um, we, we have resources, let's do what we can. And then I think the second is 
let's give more than funding, which I think is a lot of the points that we're talking about with respect to convening. I think we understand that to, for, for better or for worse, we have some influence um, in, in our respective spheres, whatever that sphere is. And so, you know, like last week, the Rockefeller Foundation um, convened a, a group of uh, Global South and Global North um, ministers from around the world, as well as um, civil society organizations, uh, think tanks, academics, to talk about, um, and this was on the sidelines of the World Bank annual meetings in DC, because everyone was in town for it. And RF has, has, that kind, has the convening power because of the 100 years of, of work that, um, existence maybe is not always work, um, that we've had. And that, that is just to create a space for that kind of conversations to be had and let other people have the conversations that are necessary to share, inform, educate, um, and use whatever light influence that we might have um, to bring people together. And I just want to mention that because I, I know a lot of people talk about convening power and we're sort of aware of it. I think we can do a lot more with it and think about influence, using our influence, but also in some ways allowing other people to use our influence. And that's not easy uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, we, we all feel like we have constraints. Um, but I think the important thing is for us to just try. So anyway, in summary, for this part, I heard um, trust, like trust the practitioners. There's something around trusting your own staff as well, um, trusting the community to know what th what's best for them. Um, and there's a, a lot around acknowledgement and transparency that we can do better at and um, give, give as much as we can, give more than money. So. Um, at this time, and this is a little bit of experiment, so let's see if this works. Um, I would love for you all to discuss this, um, some of the same things as well. And if, sorry, figuring out slides. Fig ah, okay. We're going to try Google Jamboard. Um, uh, if you have your phone, you have your laptop, um, you can, you know, either use a QR code or use, uh, type in the URL and it should take you to this Jamboard uh, slide, and you can directly put in your thoughts, use um, the stickies, the sticky notes um, that we usually have in real life, but now we can kind of share this, share in this virtual space all together, everyone gets a say, um, and just put your thoughts there. And the question is, I know while you're all uh, figuring this out, and I will say it again, but the question is, how would you recommend that funders collaborate, trust, build capacity, be more open, et cetera, while understanding that we're dealing with the reality that there is there's some need to claim credit along the way. And again, I want to put it out there that we do not live in a perfect world, so let's try and work with the realities that we have. How do we do that? How do we get all these good practices in play and understand that people are coming to the table with some ego in hand? All of us have some of that. Um, our institutions have that, so how do we do that? Any Anyone successfully got to the gem board? Not yet? Okay. If, if we can't get there in two minutes, you're welcome to raise your hand, and I think we have mics that will go around. Okay. Uh, sorry? Oh, it's swirl. Oh. <laughs> it's not working. It's not working? All right. Um, well, okay then. Spinning wheel of death. The, the wheel of death. <laughs> well, technology, you always hope it works. Yeah. Oh, that might be part of the... Okay. Well, if you have the Jamboard app, go ahead and use it. If you do not, um, then regardless, it's okay. I believe um, we have mics that we can use. Is that right? Uh, I... I can be a mic runner. <laughs> um, I have a mic. My very kind husband with our baby is, uh, is uh, going to try. <laughs> so, but I also, you know, maybe if you want to speak, oh, great, you have a mic. Beautiful baby. And uh, raise say. your hand. <laughs> Hi, um, and please I, introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Doug Beal with Boston Consulting mm -hmm. Group. So thank you for uh, all your interesting insights. Carol, question for you. You you'd said something about we need to cl claim credit. Now, I would see why somebody at BHP would want to claim some credit. That's part of your corporate, you know, but why would, some, why would Rockefeller necessarily have to, have to claim credit? And does it differ sure. between the two organizations? Sure, so. I'll, um, I'll give a real, I'll answer you really quickly just to get us going, but I also, I would love to hear your thoughts. 
um, as well. So I think the first thing is that um, for right or, rightly or wrongly, I think we think of brand and competing power as an uh, asset. It needs to be built, and it, you can use it, and you need, you need to build it, and you need to maintain it, and, and so there is some aspect of like, eventually, if we use it and use it and use, we might not have that much. So we need to be able to say like, hey, this is some of the impact that we're creating, and this is some of the difference that we're making in the world, um, in order that we can continue to be effective and have that influence over time. Like I said, rightly or wrongly, but that's just the way it sort of is today. Uh, thoughts, questions? Suggestions? Yes, please, uh, in the back. Thanks. I think you have part of the answer already yourselves, right? Which is, you're not taller, you're not smarter, you're not more good looking, right? But the reality is that people act like you are. So how do you hold those two contradictions and work through it? It's kind of the same way that, you know, when you have, say, people want credit and ego, it's the same thing. It's, it's a imperfect world that you're living in, but you're also trying to acknowledge that and make it a little less at the same time, right? So that, that's, I don't know how you do it, by the way. I actually don't know how you, so I'd actually love to hear your answer of how do you deal every day with 50 people think you're taller, smarter, good looking, and at some level, some of that probably seeps in, and you probably aren't aware of how much seeps in, even though you're aware of some of it seeping in, right? So I'm actually just curious about that too. It's, and I think it's the answer is something similar, but I don't know. Thank you. I have a response. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in a different talk, not this one, I often talk about confirmation bias. Mm. Uh, and that um, Adam Graham talks about this an awful lot. Adam Graham is a great organizational psychologist. You should all read him. He has a great book called Originals. Um, and essentially, when you look at all the various decisions that have many just big decisions that have been made in the world, uh, oftentimes a group of people can't help but get into their group think. And so in the philanthropic space, we often talk about drinking our own Kool-Aid. And, and so as the person that is continuously fighting that in the evidence space, uh, you know, I think two things. The first is um, that we do not have, there's nothing that really holds us to account. We get to spend money and the only two requirements that we have in the philanthropic space is number one, to ensure that we are spending about 5% of our corpus per every two years. Uh, and number two, um, that we are not self-dealing and essentially making grants that are going to benefit ourselves. Uh, and so uh, one of the greatest assets I think that we have is the ability to uh, put a, put a, put a sa draw a sand in the ground, oh, sorry, draw a line in the sand and actually just uh, constrain ourselves, discipline ourselves. And I often, yesterday I was in another event at Salesforce and I talked a little bit about how private sector has uh, different types of structures, checks and balances to make sure that they are they get an objective opinion. In the philanthropic space, some of us have the ability to commission evaluations and basically get a third party objective perspective on whether or not what we are hearing and what everyone is telling us is actually real. Uh, and, that, and I think in the impact investing space, the uh, way that that's turning out because you've got grant making and you've got impact investing all wrapped up in philanthropy, uh, we're beginning to dabble with the processes around impact verification and assurance because we do need a mirror to be held up to us because otherwise we will cognitively m move down a place where we could be creating lots of harms in the world because no one is willing to really shell to check us in. We essentially continue down that path and you can actually see that in many of the decisions where um, the world has signaled that things were good. I'll talk about the Rockefeller Foundation because I can. <laughs> um, the Green Revolution in Asia, it was fabulously successful. We got a, the Rockefeller Foundation got a World Food Prize for it, a Peace Prize for it. And essentially things were good. And then you take, you take a look like 20 years down the line and many of the safety, health, and environmental challenges that we're experiencing is because we didn't check ourselves in. We solved the immediate, but we didn't plan for the long term. And that's just a really good example of how this work is so complicated and how you do need those checks and balances. Well, in philanthropic capital, it's often seen as risk capital and flexible and no one is going to hold you to account. Therefore, it's a choice. So we need to be making better choices. Mm -hmm. 
which is actually the well, Martin, do you have something to add? Oh no, yeah. I was just about to say that. You know, every morning my wife would bring me down to earth very quickly. <laughs> so it helps that way. Um, on the operational side, we do try to structure that away as well. Um, so, like for us, um, I actually I raise all the money. I don't control the money. My board doesn't control the money. We delegate down to grant panels. So I run nine funds currently. I have a youth mental health fund, a dementia fund. Every fund has a grant panel. And the grant panel is chaired by one of my board, one of my board member, one of my donors, and one subject matter expert who knows the ground within Singapore in that particular space. The team, in working in all these grant meetings with, with the partners, then put forward a recommendation to the grant panel. And the grant panel has the mandate from the board to make the final decision with regards to that money. So what, we, what we're effectively doing is to structure out this whole dynamic that even my grant folks uh, who was working with the majority trust when they go and meet people, they realize they don't have the power. The grant panel finally has it. Um, so when people come up to me and say, oh, you know, you are looking very good today. I say, you know what, I don't control money. And then very, very shortly, the, the, the time cut, cut from one hour to 10 minutes. Uh, so it's life. So uh, what we're trying to do is to structure that in, in a, a, um, a, a structural way so that power is not uh, residing in a small group of people but it's spread across, um, and that allows us to actually do our work better. They can tell us a lot more information. Uh, one of our key uh, metrics of success internally is how honest our grantee partners are to us. If they have failed, or if they're slow, or if there's a delay, how quickly do they tell us? So we measure that. Because if we have a good relationship with them, the faster they tell us, the faster we can help them. But if they only see us as a grant maker, then there is this power relationship, then they don't want to tell us, then we have failed at our job. So what we're trying to do is to rethink what this grant making relationship is about, um, and that would help uh, what the, basically the question you were having. That's great. Um, okay, I know that there are a couple of questions. I'm gonna take one, um, and because there will be more opportunity for, for people to sort of chime in, and I believe there was one on this side from earlier. I just wanna make sure we're including you all in the room. And may I say, you are welcome to come join us in the center so I can definitely see you. Yes, hi, yes. Yeah, sure, on the, um, the topic of credit, I was thinking, in, in my opinion, the most interesting and probably effective philanthrop philanthropist in recent history is Mackenzie Scott, who's given away something like 10 billion in the last three years. And she avoids all media attention, she doesn't do reporting, she writes a medium blog every once in a while. And I. I mean, and to me it raises a broader question of, uh, if we think about the urgency of, of the crises we face now, why do we need to perpetuate philanthropies into the indefinite future? I mean, why are more philanthropies looking at a spend down strategy to get the money out now? And again, if we're winding down or spending down, we don't, we don't need the credit, we don't need the publicity. So that, maybe I don't know if that's a question or a provocation, but that's what's on my mind. Thank you. I mean, and you know, like you said, we're seeing more of it nowadays, right? I think we are moving in slowly the direction. I think it's going to take, I, I don't know if we'll ever truly get there, but I think that is, that is an excellent point that, you know, we should all bear in mind um, for potential going forward. Okay, um, I, I, I want to make sure that we are able to get to um, all the interesting topics that we do want to cover, and Veronica did bring up an excellent point about how do we make good decisions how, um, as funders. And I, I think there's already elements of what some people are saying, right? Like, you know, we don't want to live in an echo chamber, we should hear different voices, um, all that. Um, but I put the question to you both uh, to start us off, and then we want to hear the same thing from all of you as well. Um, how do we make good decisions in philanthropy, in social investment, in whatever, again, whatever kind of capital that you're allocating if you're on the side of things? Um, Who wants to go first? <laughs> yeah, well, Martin looks ready, so let's do that. Sure. Um, one, of the, one of the ways we look at uh, philanthropic decisions, whether we start a fund or not, or whether we enter a particular area or not, uh, is try to be as best as possible, uh, be research informed. Um, so, one of my first hires at the Majority Trust is an economist um, because I wanted to know from a, a cost-benefit perspective, how do I make sense of social needs? 
uh, because I'm very mindful, I have to work with donors and I need to give them data and information on a particular area and what would social impact look like. Um, so research became a big part, but research through the lens of economics, it's research through the lens of not just um, social science, but rather saying, hey, this particular need is going to create X amount of problem. And I'll give you an example. We're dealing with dementia in Singapore. Uh, now, Singapore is a small country. Uh, for those of you who have been, we have 5.8 million people. We have about 80,000 people uh, are persons with dementia. That's about 80,000. By 2030, it's going to be 120,000. On a per year basis, it costs us about $74,000 in both direct and opportunity costs, largely because when you have a parent who's suffering from dementia, one family member typically get out of the workforce to take care. Uh, we typ in, in, the, in the Asian culture, philopathy is such a big part, we stick very close to each other. So some, one family member typically leaves. So it costs about 74000 So in 10 years' time, we're dealing with a billion-dollar problem. Now, that's my way of having the ability to take these numbers, go to my donors and say, hey, we think this is an issue. We should really invest in this issue and philanthropically give to the issue. So um, data is an important aspect. When we work with our grantee partners, we don't give them just the money. We ask them for information. So we ask them for metrics that we can measure. With that metric, we then have the ability to analyze the data, package the data, generate insights, and then we go back to our donors again and say, you know what? The money that you have given for this particular fund has paid out $4 to a dollar in terms of social impact because of what these charities have done. And in hope, then they will say, you know what, I'll give you more resources for the next grant call and so on. So research is a really important aspect. Um, the only caution I'll put in, and it's something we're trying very hard to build, is that research shouldn't just be academic because if we work close enough with our grantee partners on the ground, a large part of research can be informed by the ground because they know far better than we do in our 35,000 square feet view, uh, not square feet, but... Uh, uh, macro view. Uh, they know what's happening. So using the dementia as an example, one of the biggest pivots uh, that we did last year of the what we call Silver is Gold Fund, which is dementia fund, is that we have moved the funding criteria more than just benefiting from persons with dementia, but to caregivers of persons with dementia. We now have learned that the challenge isn't the person with dementia, but the caregivers who is actually providing the care. They are the one that's suffering from mental anguish. They are the one that's suffering from fatigue. They are the one that's actually facing a lot of challenges uh, in terms of you know, social mobility and so on and so forth. So we have pivoted the fund, not because an academic research tells us, but because our grantee partners have feedback through the data they have collected and say, you know what, if you don't start addressing this, we are going to see a far bigger problem. Those with dementia has a medical help and the medical system will provide that help, but no one is helping the caregivers. Um, so how do we uh, do respite care? Um, so we funded an arts gallery uh, who created a whole program uh, in the gallery to bring persons with dementia. So they will have guides that bring them and see old paintings and help them recollect Singapore of old and so on. But the caregivers during that time get respite care. They get another program of their own. They get uh, uh, support and so on and so on. So we're looking for uh, innovative and interesting ideas like that. Um, so research becomes a big part. How do we make decisions is to look at what data tells us, mm -hmm. to look at what the research tells us, and more importantly, what the grantee partners are really letting us know. Um, allowing research brings us away from what we call network philanthropy to inform philanthropy. Uh, I'm not sure about in the US, but I, I suspect it'd be about the same. A lot of philanthropy goes to people whom you know. So if you have a really, really wealthy chairman who has very wealthy network, your charity typically get more funds than a smaller charity who's doing very effective work but don't have that kind of board members. So how do we then change that game where we move from network philanthropy to informed philanthropy where donors are asking the right questions? So it's beyond, you know, I know you're my mate, but your numbers are not actually hitting what they say they would. Why would I give you the million dollars when that million dollars I can actually give to this smaller charity is doing the same work and they're paying $4 to a dollar to a certain extent. Now, it's going to take a while. I don't think we'll ever go away with network philanthropy because that's where, how relationship goes. Uh, but if we can at least start asking, getting donors to ask the right questions, to really get data, to really get analytics involved, to really say, hey, is this efficient? Is this effective? Then I think we can start uh, moving into a very different direction. Yeah. 
Um, ground up intel is absolutely crucial I, um, as like just a critical takeaway that I, I feel like I'm also getting. And um, Veronica, what about you? So that's such a controversial question to ask an evaluator. Yes. <laughs> I'll just say. Um, I'm on tender. Yes. Uh, so, you know, it's interesting because in probably the 20 years that I've actually been in the research space, I've seen very few decisions be made based on data and the evidence base. I've, I've almost, almost, I, I've tested that out. You know, I've said, okay, let's spend a lot of time collecting the perfect data in the way that we want it, to do, um, checking off all of the boxes, and here was the data, and here was the decision, and it was not correlated. So, the, this idea that uh, we make data-based decisions in philanthropy specifically, but also in other parts of the world or in other parts of the ecosystem, I think is an artificial false belief. Mm -hmm. However, data can help you make some decisions. It just might not help you make the right decisions. So, um, but three things that I have taken away from how we could be thinking about it differently. Um, number one is, putting the money out the door and then asking the question around what impact is that making, and I see this a lot in the impact investing space, is it gonna help you answer the question? Because at that point, it's too late. The money has gone out the door. What is the decision you need to make? Uh, get the data and know whether or not it has worked or not worked in order to do what? And so I really appreciate that thing, efforts like the impact management platform have done things like really started to bring in an impact lens to your due diligence processes. Because what is the decision you need to make? You need to know whether or not you are going to invest or fund in a particular intervention. That's a decision. So being intentional about your decisions is part of the puzzle, as Martin, you were also being, um, speaking to. Number two, so other ways that I've seen this play out is the money goes out the door and you're done. The money, you've made the investment, you've made the grant. Uh, and so the decision though, it, to me, is that's where the work really starts. You need information coming through various different channels in order to know whether or not you are quote unquote adaptively managing, which is the word of choice. And then number three, because we've talked about how we somewhat live in an echo chamber, we need that, that, we need to hold up that mirror. At the end of the day, did you do good? Did you do bad? Did you do more good than bad, more bad than good? You're not going to know that without actually commissioning, without asking the question. And so that, to me, makes impact measurement, impact management, all things impact, not a technical skill set, but a strategic one. And I think that one of, the, uh, one of the learnings that I have observed from the private sector, now that I'm working pretty closely with them, is that uh, they wouldn't hire uh, you know, a non-expert to manage their financial system or their risk system. So why is it that all of a sudden people walk in, and I've seen this happen time and time again in the philanthropic space. You walk in, you wake up one day, you go to work, and you have, now, you have no background in any of this work, but now, you have been deemed the impact measurement person. And now it's your job to figure all these pieces out. And so I think that uh, more and more in the philanthropic um, space and in the capital markets, we just need to get smarter about hiring the right talent to do the right job. Because if we already know that this is going to be very expensive, we already know that, uh, that we need impact data to make impactful decisions, and if we already know that the work is complex, I'm hearing over and over again that I don't know where to start, it's so complex, then hire someone that knows something about data and about impact specifically. Uh, lots of provocations here. Um, I'm sure there are lots of responses. Um, I think one of, the, one of the things that was most stunning and still continues to be stunning to me today is the fact that data doesn't necessarily translate to the right decisions. Lots of evidence doesn't necessarily lead to evidence-based decision-making. Um, and, and, you know, there's a whole thing about decision science and everything that ex like gets into why that would be the case. But I think it's helpful for us to bear that in mind and to bear the human elements in mind of um, how decisions get made. And then also 
I, I think some, the point that um, Veronica was making is that having the right processes at the right time, doing, thinking about your impact before your money goes out the door is a way to help you, like, or help us think about making the, not just a smart decision, but the right decision for what is happening at that point in time. And um, the, the one thing I will also add to like, these excellent points is that one of the like, key things about decisions is timing. Um, we are in, in, the, in the latest discourse on philanthropy, it is really important that, and we're hearing this, that we need to slow down to let people in and be part of the process, and I think that's absolutely critical. And I don't want to, um, I don't want to. Uh, I, I think that's such an important point to emphasize. And at the same time, um, I also have seen and personally done this myself that when sometimes we spend so long looking at data and finding the perfect strategy and does the problem match and and all that and. There needs to be something in between, and I think there's part of slow down to let people in. But once, but we need to know when we have just enough to make a decision and to decide decisively, and then move quickly to get things out the door. The way we did in co like during COVID, and you know, for the most part, most of the a lot of that work was very impactful. Um, so just wanna leave that point, and also. Um, you know, open, open it up again because I can see people are kind of like jumping out of their seats a little bit to, to get in. And so, you know, I, I, I would love to hear your thoughts. I would also like to hear a little bit um, how you would suggest funders can internalize the feedback and to have more of these processes to help us think about making the smart and right decision and timely decision. And I'd love, uh, yeah, for this lady in the front who's been uh, very enthusiastic. Um, hi, I'm Rahiba. I'm part of Common Future. We power community solutions that advance racial and economic justice. Mm -hmm. Before I answer your question, Carol, one of the things I want to reflect back is that statistic that you shared, right? So $490 billion um, transacted in the philanthropic sector in the United States. One thing that gets overlooked quite often is who does it go to? And most often it's Eds and Meds, right? Whereas just in the United States, the 1.8 million nonprofits that exist, about a million of them are under a million dollars. That tells you something. You know, they're bootstrapped, they're under-resourced, underestimated, overlooked. And oftentimes these nonprofits are not gonna make it onto your docket because they don't have the systems, the know-hows, the time to fill the reporting criteria at the Rockefeller Foundation, at BH, BH mm -hmm. Group, and others, right? So my question is, and I think at Common Future, we think deeply about not only just what we do, but how we do the work. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we say is, in order to change the how, you need to change the who, mm -hmm. right? And the who mm -hmm. are the most closest to the problems, mm -hmm. the most proximate mm -hmm. to the problems, have the solutions. Mm -hmm. So a better decision for philanthropy, because we are in the grant making and investing space, is that how do you involve the community in that decision making power? Because ultimately, all the things that we saw in that word cloud, um, colonizer, supremacist, all of those things have to do with power, right? And decision making at the root of it is power. So how are you relinquishing power and mm -hmm. giving decision making authority mm -hmm. to grantees and investees and those closest to the problems because they're gonna be the best equipped um, to make those decisions? Great point, thank you. Uh, yes, I am going to need some help moderating, so please, yeah, make space. And um, maybe after uh, this lovely lady, I also want to move around a little bit around the room. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. My name is Rebecca Waterhouse. I'm with the Raven Indigenous Impact Foundation based in Canada. We work to co-create community alternative financing solutions to health and climate issues, namely in outcomes finance. Um, this was a wonderful question. Thank you. You probably posed it much more eloquently than I will, um, but I'm building off of that. It's really kind of more of a direct question to your organizations regarding how are you working to address the accessibility gap? Funders in Canada, from our perspective, um, as it relates to impact measurement, don't really fund it. They don't like to, it's expensive. As we know, those that need the systems, the piping, the infrastructure to actually 
step up to receive that next kind of follow-on tranche funding to get to the scale that they want to go to can't get there. Um, and so impact measurement is really nice in theory. Um, I just want to hear from your perspectives as to how perhaps you are legislating with your grantees that you will pay for all of their impact measurement. Um, just trying to get some ideas here. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I can say one quick thing, but actually, really, you know, Veronica is like the, the real expert here, at least on the, you know, the history of the RF side of things. Um, I, I have just, to, you know, maybe this is helpful to know. I don't work on the program side of things right now. I work on our policy and advocacy and um, communications pieces. But when I did work on the program side, we worked with our grantees to insert line items into the programs and their grants specific to impact measurement. Now, that's not done systematically every time. I think it is, at least historically, has been driven very much by um, sort of individual programs, individual program officers. Um, but I would say if, you know, if that is possible, like have the conversation with the funder, or if you're a funder, consider that if, if possible. Um, but I want to turn to both of you. And Maybe I'll take it from an organization point yeah. of view, just an, a, a, to explain. Do you think I can have the slide? Uh, oh, yeah. The, the life cycle slide? Of course. Uh, maybe I'll use that and answer both questions at the same time. Uh, Let me know which one. Uh, just the one before, this one. Yeah. Yeah. So if I can have the slide on. Um, this, this is our view of things. Uh, we, we look at organization uh, in a, in a we life, what we call life cycle Thank fund. You. There we go. Um, so there are two types of funds for us at the Majority Trust. We have what we call the life cycle funds and then we have the cause-based funds. So as I've shared, I have the dementia fund, the youth mental health fund and so on. But when we look at organization, we look at zero to nine and, and, and beyond. Um, at zero is the ground up groups, the non-registered charities. Uh, one, two, three are your startup phase, your four, five, six, your growth. And in each, we have designed a specific fund with a specific outcome. Um, and I think to your question earlier about the one million smaller charities, um, it, I, I, a large part of my thinking is that size and the largeness of the organization does not equate necessary impacts. Not all organizations have to grow big. The same thing when we work with our ground up groups, we tell them that some things are better to be as a movement than not an organization. You achieve far better outcomes as a movement than an organization. Organizations find it hard to grow movements, but grassroots non-registered ground up have that ability to scale uh, in a way that brings forth your outcomes far better than an organized charity can. So we talk down, talk, talk down to our people. We talk down some of our grantee partners to say, you know what, don't register. There is no point for you because what you are doing, you can grow organically as a volunteer-based organization. You really don't need to incur the cost and so on. So we continue to fund them under the SG Strong Fund as a ground-up group. Then there are those that have the ability to scale. All right. Uh, if given more resources, they can register themselves, get a lot more funding, and then we can actually help them uh, grow to a certain extent. That's where our incubator fund, the New Horizon fund, helps them to a certain extent. So a, a, response, a quick response to your question. I, I don't think size is that matter. It's perfectly okay to have a, a million smaller uh, charities, so as long as they're funded sufficiently to do what they are doing now. There are those that need to grow and scale because what they do can be multiplied across nationally. How do we therefore identify them? What we're trying to do very, uh, what we're trying very hard to do is to become like the Y Combinator of the philanthropic space in Singapore, right? Y Combinator works great because they get some of the coolest startups. So the funders, the VCs like Y Combinator because they see things that they otherwise won't see outside. But the smaller ones also want to become a Y Combinator um, fellow because they have access to VCs that are looking for interesting things. So we want Majority Trust to grow to be a first port of call for smaller charity startups because we have funders who have the ability. And for our funders, they want to come to Majority Trust because, oh, they see things that they otherwise don't see uh, to a certain extent. So where does impact measurement come in? And to your question, is that we then do the impact measurement on our end because we have to report to our funders. And I do it on an individual grantee level. That report is made available to our grantee partners. 
So they then take our report and say, hey, a third party va uh, evaluator have said this is our performance of their fund. They now take this to go to other funders, right? So it's the same amount of money I've raised and I do, the same work that I do because I need to compile at an organize at a fund level report and an organizational level report, I make that available for the grantee partners. Therefore, indirectly, I'm funding their social impact measurements, but all I need them to help me with is to do the data collection, which is part of our grant uh, making process. So I'm trying to do that at an aggregated level, if that makes sense, um, because we have the expertise to be able to do that. Um, and then we make that available to the grantee partners so that they can use it. So just an, an example of how we do that here in Singapore. So, so many things, so many places, um, um, so many points where I can start. And um, I think, you know, just building from the bottom um, out, I think the way that we've approached knowing something, and, you know, at the very simplest and basic level um, at the BHP Foundation is structured around the minimum requirements. What is the minimum amount of things, whether they be data, whether they be something else that we need to know in order to make a decision. And to Martin's point, taking on that burden within our system. Uh, and I think that if we were all to take that approach, then we would actually stop overly burdening the people that are actually busy doing the work from all the pieces of information that we need to go to our various, up our various different decision-making channels. And so our, we have a policy um, that we've agreed with with our board uh, to, to do that at both the project, at the project program and organizational level because we really see ourselves as actors within the ecosystem. So just taking that minimum perspective. Um, however, what I wanted to say is building on the earlier comment around trust-based philanthropy. So this is the new word. We've talked about McKinsey Scott. Uh, uh, and what does trust-based philanthropy really mean? Uh, some, in some places, it's translated as core support, operational support. In other places, it's being translated as um, no reporting. So it's like all this we trust. And actually, if you really think about it, from a reasonable perspective, if you put money into a problem, it doesn't mean that good things will happen. How do you know that good things are happening and that you're minimizing the bad thing? So I think living in a world where no requirements is, a rea um, is not actually the responsible thing to do. And we really need to be thinking about what is the responsible way we should be approaching philanthropy. Um, and so from my perspective, and coming back to your point around the indigenous, right behind you, the indigenous communities piece, um, the BHP Foundation, I find it a really interesting organization. Uh, we're only seven years old. I often describe it as when I joined the MasterCard Foundation many years ago, it was only seven years old. So it's considered a startup philanthropy. And the benefit of starting up in this page, in this time, is that we don't need to be convinced that core support is important. We don't need to be convinced that multi-year, multi-million dollar funding is important and that we need to minimize those requirements across all of our various actors. We also don't need to be convinced that if uh, that we need to segment our partners to some extent and that core support to small entities that are working with indigenous communities, whether in Canada or Australia or in the US, which is something that we actually do because 95% of all the mining sites are on indigenous land. Um, we don't need to be convinced that, 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 we don't, that we need to do all of those things. I think the challenge is that we live in an ecosystem that is not efficient. And, that, um, and just because we don't ask that and require that of our partners, or that we provide core support for data collection, or that we provide core support for a capacity building and technical assistance, um, is that they are not working within an optimal system. And so we, the challenge we have is observing the fact that we all talk about our espoused theory around philanthropy, but then when we start to action it and operationalize it, it's often a contradiction. So we talk about how we um, want to co-create with our partners, um, which we do often listen to our partners and communities, but yet we do that after we've made all the decisions. We talk about our grant making processes, and we have these, in certain, philanthropies, we have these like large, very complex systems um, that requires you to ask many, many different questions and program officers themselves 
push that burden onto their partners. And they actually push it on and say that they justify it by saying their board wants this information, their senior management wants this information. However, if we at an ind very individual level saw ourselves as needing to be responsible and the only thing you can actually control is your day-to-day -day decisions, I think that we would be in a different place. And I really think that the people that are most equipped to be in those positions are people that have experienced poverty before and that have experienced marginalization and challenges. Because once you can empathize with that, your choices are going to be very different and you will be equipped to speak truth to power. And that is eventually what we have to get to because the people that control the actual endowments and the actual funds are amongst the most powerful people in the world. And so really, that is what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about really the, the, the good angel and the bad angel. I'm always thinking about like, okay, this is what I wanna do because this is how I can get ahead in life. This is how I can move money out the door. This is how I can get the perfect quality data. But I have to continuously be testing and challenging my own self to ask my, myself, but is this really going to change anything? Mm -hmm. And if it isn't, then why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. So truth to power, we all have agency in our respective areas. Um, and you know, I think half the conversation about what funding is really necessary, I think thinking about being funded to do what you really need to be doing, or funding enough to enable our partners to be doing what we really want to be doing is so critical. Um, I am very aware that we're running um, short on time. Uh, we have, yes, I am getting signals everywhere of timing. Um, so I, I will say, I, I think maybe we are gonna sort of wrap up and I wanna sort of hear um, your final thoughts as well on how we move forward. Um, and, and you know, I, I, I think we can stick around for a couple of minutes and, and chat if people want to um, after, depending on what's going on with the venue. Um, so just to summarize a couple of things that we've discussed today, and I think to put it out there, we have the limit, we are limited by our respective perspectives as well. We understand, I understand that I do not necessarily have any or all of the answers, but just to share a little bit of the perspectives that we have. And it is important for all of us to be a part of it and to keep raising um, all the important points that have been coming up today, because the journey has only just begun. And um, if, you know, I, I mentioned how we give is really important, right, at the very beginning. <clears throat> and we've been discussing how to be humankind, how to do philanthropy effectively. Um, and so I think one of the things I heard loud and clear was trust the practitioners, trust the ground, trust the people who are closest to it, who have lived experience, the community, and, and everything that they're telling us. Um, there's a lot about enabling the ecosystem. Um, investing in impact measurement, and there's a lot of nuance, of course, there in how to invest and when is the right time to invest in impact inve in measurement. Um, you know, bring our other types of assets, including funding, but beyond funding, to the table. Um, and how do we be responsible? Whatever that means in um, a lot of different our different contexts, but we met a number of us are in positions where we can take decisions, so let's make sure we are taking decisions instead of sitting on the assets um, for a long time. Um, think about systemic issues, think about our funding and how quickly they're moving, the utilization point, the commitment rates, um, and feedback is so important. And just to bring it back to the trust, I think I just keep thinking about the word feedback um, because we should not and should probably not want to live in an echo chamber. Um, so bottom line is I think humility and responsibility probably go a big part I think in, in this space for us. And um, well, I, I wanna end with, uh, I hope a little bit more uh, of a hopeful lens. You know, we have discussed some of the challenges today. We have discussed some of the ways forward. What in two sentences would you say would be your vision and your hope for the story that philanthropy will be telling in five to 10 years time that hopefully would give us a little bit more, a little bit different types of word clouds in the future. Um, maybe, ver <laughs> yes, I feel like I've sure, talked a lot. Martin will go and we will have a- I feel, a, I feel being Veronica bullied to start up. first. Um, can I do in three? Is that okay? <laughs> Is that all right? You, you have uh, okay, some I'll do it discretion. very quickly. Go for it. Uh, because I was asked to think about the future of philanthropy and I, can I wrap up around three Ps that I'll, I'll end? Um, one of the biggest change for me or a development of philanthropy is the whole mindset. 
that giving is a privilege. It's not power. Um, I find that if we can adopt and the philanthropists can adopt that, you know what? It's such a privileged position to give. Um, and when we have that mindset, the way we work with people will change. Um, not everyone are in the position to give. It's a real, real privilege. If I, I think about the future of philanthropy and if, if philanthropists and donors really see the wealth they have to give as a privilege, I actually think that the dynamics of the way we work with each other will change. Um, so that's the first P. The second thing that I hope about the future of philanthropy is that of patience. A lot of social impact work takes time. Um, a lot of the money comes from the capital markets. We, we tend to think from a capitalist point of view that we want to see results in one, two, three years to a certain extent. Some things just take time. Um, and if philanthropy can take a very long-term view, and many funders are like that, uh, but not all funders, there's new money and old money, the new money in the tax space, are very used to uh, seeing things immediately. But philanthropy doesn't work that way. So, and then last but not least is the third P, which is people. Um, that a large part of philanthropy isn't just about the work, but about the investment in the right people, the right talent. Um, so that would be the, the last thing I would say, that trust the people who have dedicated their lives to doing good, give them the resource, invest in them, then the magic will happen. The money on its own will not create any magic. It's the people that we invest that will create the magic. So we have no time, so I'll just um, say, you know, well, uh, building on uh, Martin's point around being patient and patient capital, um, I agree with that point, but I do want to then leave you with the sense of, of the failure to launch point. point. Um, we do sit in privileged places, however, we are living in urgent times. Um, the clock is ticking, our climate change challenges are ticking. And so really acknowledging that every day counts. Um, and so living with purpose, um, is, I think, is really critical. However, I want to flip the what can we do better back to the audience and mm -hmm. say, you know, given that we do live in a world where philanthropy isn't really held to account, um, I think that it's on all of us and all of you to hold us to account. And I challenge you to hold us to account to the choices that we make and to the impacts that we say that we um, are for. Um, because if you're not going to hold us to account, and I mean that within philanthropy, I mean that within impact investing, I mean that within the capital markets, um, then, you know, then if you're not holding us to account, then no one is. And so that is your challenge. Thank you. Thank you so much um, to my wonderful friends. And thank you to all of you who have been such a wonderful group to have this conversation with to being more human together, okay? Let's do this.